all all um, lectures are going to be uploaded um, to YouTube. I will be putting the links in um, in Blackboard, and it'll probably be to the playlist, and you'll be able to find it. They'll all be on my YouTube channel uh, and publicly available to everybody. Then the the second thing is all lecture notes that I'm putting up in the course are going to be available on Blackboard after the lecture. The lecture notes are not, with very, very few exceptions, are not pre-prepared slides. So we're not going to have things pre-drawn on there. We're not going to have words written down except for like titles and things to kind of remind me what I should be talking about. Um, so you're not like there's not there's nothing that you're missing in a way of preparative material for a given lecture. It's it, it doesn't exist until it's written down in class. So if you're um, struggling to keep up because you're trying to write down everything that's written down you're going to get exactly what is written down online. So you will have access to those notes. Um, so I think what you should focus on, if you're taking notes during class, if that's your style, then focus on things that aren't being written down um, or new concepts or things you're thinking about or something you wanna come back to or questions you've got. That's probably a lot better use of your time and you're writing resources instead of trying desperately to copy everything that's written down because you're gonna have all those notes verbatim anyways. So, pop this thing off. Okay. So, I'm just trying to get my computer to behave. So, I, I think th those are the materials that are going to be available to you. I'm going to be posting. Well, let's start going through the syllabus. I think that might be the best way to proceed. So, I'm actually going to share the syllabus. So if we can see this, I want to just highlight a few things. So I'm starting with the undergraduate syllabus. This is a joint graduate undergraduate course. Um, on Friday, we had four undergraduates registered. As of this morning, we have two undergraduates registered. So and the syllabus went up between there and then. I wonder if that has anything to be associated with it. Um, the course is two times 1.5 hours a week. We're going to cover some material focusing on um, sugar chemistry, amino acid chemistry, uh, and then biomaterials um, defined primarily in terms of biodegradable polymers and self immolated materials and polymers with those derived from biocompatible materials. We're also going to be covering some concepts around stimuli responsive materials. This course fits into the curriculum in two ways. In one, it is meant to act as a, uh, a course in bioorganic chemistry. We do not offer any other courses in bioorganic chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and we should go fourth year level. The second thing is it complements other materials sciences courses offered in a department. Those courses focus uh, a lot on um, traditional petroleum-based polymer synthesis and characterization and nanoparticle functionalization and nanoparticle synthesis and all that stuff. Um, we're not going to focus as much on that because that is, it would just be duplication of another uh, course's material. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it for anyone who wants to discuss it when we get to that component of the course and you're feeling that you're not taking any of those other courses so it's irrelevant that there's a duplication. Uh, so we can get into a little bit of that and just some basic characterization techniques available to us. Um, time commitment standard. There is no text for the course. There are some recommended references. Uh, these are generally available either at the library. Um, I can get you a totally legitimate copy of Glycoscience if you want it. Uh, but in general, I think that any textbook there's no textbook written for this kind of course. It just doesn't exist. So I think Wikipedia and the primary literature and the stuff that I'm going to provide you is probably a much better source and review liter uh, review papers are a much better source for covering the material than any textbook. It's kind of beyond uh, textbooks, although it does fall into the space of reference books like Glycoscience or the Stephen Paul solid phase peptide synthesis book. If you 
are a real textbook person and you feel massively uncomfortable if you do not have a textbook in your hand, I do recommend these uh, Oxford University primers. They have one in amino acid synthesis, one in carbohydrate chemistry. They've got some in material science as well. Um, they're, they used to be incredibly inexpensive. Now they're just only moderately expensive. I think you're looking at about 25 to 30 bucks a book. Uh, they're available on Amazon uh, and probably cheaper from Oxford University Press directly. So for the undergraduate students, your grade is 40, 40, 20. Uh, 40 for the midterm, 40 for the final, uh, which is going to cover, so the midterm is going to cover mostly carbohydrate chemistry uh, and anything we've covered up to the point of the midterm. The final is going to cover mostly peptide chemistry and biomaterials chemistry, and the final is cumulative. And then you're going to do a presentation on a topic of your choice, since there are two of you. Uh, you can do it together as a team, there's no reason you guys need to do it separately. And on anything that interests you remotely related to carbohydrate, amino acid, or biomaterials chemistry, uh, or biochemistry, or material science. We've had presentations on everything from um, protecting groups for cysteines, to solar panels made from biomaterials, to, I can't remember the other presentations in the past, uh, but we've covered like uh, to specific enzymes. So, it's very broad. I think you can lean towards your specialty. If you're more a biochemist, you can do something that's more about chemistry. If you're more a chemist, you can do something more chemistry. If you're more a material scientist, you can do something more material science-y. Or ideally, maybe something interdisciplinary between everything. That's entirely up to you. Uh, I'm judging it based on the rules that you're setting for that. And down below, it sort of states sort of the checkpoints so we're making sure that we're on the same page so that you walk out of there with 19 or 20 out of 20 because that's the whole point. Um, the midterm and the final are the same for both the graduate level and the undergraduate level class. The graduate level class will have an additional question or two. The questions on the midterm and final come directly from the assignments or very slight modifications of the questions on the assignments, probably more of the latter. So change a little thing here, but if you understood what you were doing with the assignment, you're not going to have any problem with the midterm or final. They are a completely open book. Um, the midterm shorter, I give you about three hours for it. The final is longer. Uh, it should take three hours, but I'll give you five. And you submit your exams. So I send you out the exam. Uh, you write the exam. You send me back pictures of the exam because it's all virtual. But again, the questions come from the assignments for the most part. So and by, for the most part, I mean I tweak a little something. So if you do the assignments, then you should be in great shape for doing the exams. And you know, I say this, I, I've taught this course, I think this is the fourth time I've taught this course, and I say this every year, and some students who do the assignments come to me afterwards and said, wow, they really did come right from the assignments. I go, yes, that's exactly what I said. And I've had other students who do quite poorly in the course who said, well, I didn't think they would come directly from the assignments, although you said they were gonna come from the assignments, so I didn't do the assignments. And I was trying to do the assignments during the exam. And that's really, really hard to do. So um, because everyone's coming from different backgrounds, I'm trying to make this as fair as possible by giving everyone the amount of time they need to carry to learn the material. Uh, and that's the whole point of providing assignments instead of trying to evaluate you in a closed book hour and a half exam. So they're open book. You can use absolutely any resource to write the midterm or final except another human being. And that can be a human being in person or a human being online or a human being communicating with smoke signals or like, you know, carrier worms, I don't know. Uh, but if it, if it is printed material and has been pre-prepared, then you it is completely valid for you to use it to uh, write the midterm and final. Um, if I catch people cheating because there aren't that many of you and I mark all the exams and some of the answers are ridiculously similar, then that's, you know, results and zeros. Um, you know, maybe there's 250, 300 people on the planet who would really be able to write this midterm and final in the time allotted and be able to help. So I'm not all that worried about people cheating with somebody outside of the course. So, but again, that would be um, breaking ethical boundaries and results in zero. You have to write your own exams.
and I can't believe I actually have to say this, but every year there is somebody who tries to do it and then they get a zero and then they go crying to the dean's office and then the dean's office says, can you show me evidence that they cheated? And I do, and then they go, yep, okay, that's a zero. So please don't make me do that. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of everybody's time. Okay, so the learning uh, outcomes is this is based for people with some background in organic chemistry. I, I try and pitch it so that if you have sort of two terms with or worth of organic chemistry, you're familiar with fundamental arrow pushing mechanism, nucleophilic attacks, elimination, you should be okay. Um, if you don't know anything I just said, this might not be a great course for you, but it's kind of like the stuff we teach at the second year undergraduate level here, um, which every single science major has to take. So at the end of this course, we're going to be, you're going to be familiar with carbohydrates, amino acids, peptides, glycoconjugates, and various forms of biomaterials. You're going to be able to determine synthetic pathways, repair these types of materials. Um, you'll be able to design appropriate amino acids for synthesis, uh, discuss deep protection purification methods for these types of systems, and interpret um, structure activity relationship data to iteratively design new molecules to probe biological questions. Uh, including with biomaterials, uh, carbohydrates, and peptides. So for the undergraduates, this does not apply to the graduates. Uh, we'll talk about the graduate uh, thing in a moment. You need to do a presentation. Um, submission of these different components on time is worth 1% of that 20%. So by October 1st, you need a topic, broadly defined. You can change that topic later if you like but uh, you need to have some idea of what you want to do. If you have no idea and nothing makes any sense, I can send you a long list of options of things you can choose from. But I, I really prefer that you find something that you find personally interesting. And when it comes down to it, everything relates to, well, not everything, most everything can be related to sugars, amino acids, or materials in some way. Most materials can be spun as biomaterials. Um, by October 20th, I require kind of a detailed outline of the presentation, so what you're going to be covering. Um, not sort of slide by slide, but just generally, hey, here's a one pager that kind of summarizes the argument that we're going to be making through the presentation. By November 15th, I need about a bibliography, about greater than 20 references should be going into this. Again, you're going to be kind of doing a presentation on a review of, of the literature. and you should have about 20 plus references that go in, have gone in to inform your decision and discussion. The presentation will then take place the first week of December, uh, December 6th, uh, approximately 40 minutes with five minutes of questions. So if there's two of you, it's 20 minutes each. It's a review of the literature. So um, you're not needing to come up with anything new. The marking of the presentations will be done as follows, 20% for the quality of the slides. Um, so they. They should look better than the slides I'm going to do because I'm going to scribble on them and you're going to have pre-prepared presentation slides. 20% um, for the quality of the presentation, um, which should probably be spelt right. So uh, just, is this a well-argued, uh, organized presentation? And again, this should be more or less in the bag because back here we had a detailed outline. And if you more or less follow the outline, I've approved your outline and we've discussed your outline, then there's no reason that you should have any problem with this 20%. Um, Ideally, you're not going to be speaking in a monotone, so enthusiasm and ability to guide the listener through the presentation, and uh, we'll try and keep all the grad students awake. And then 30% for the actual content of your presentation. And so is the content level appropriate for a senior undergraduate level class? So it's um, if, if I'm watching the presentation, I'm thinking you're covering content that I would expect to see in a first year or second year course that isn't appropriate. If it's appropriate for a third, fourth year class, uh, great. If you're covering material in a complex way, at what I consider sort of a higher graduate level, awesome bonus marks, you can go above 30%. Um, you're showing that you're not just like listing, they did this, they did this, they did this, but you're showing that there's a synthesis of the elements from different references. So you're integrating things together and putting analysis and thought. Uh, demonstration of analysis and critical evaluation of literature. And hopefully I learned something new. Uh, I don't know much about anything, so I should be learning something new in any presentation anyone gives about anything, except like my PhD thesis that I probably do know quite a lot about. So again, this 
is the absolute critical thing. Like this is what an undergraduate degree all comes down to in the end, or a graduate degree for that matter, is being able to critically analyze and evaluate the scientific literature. If you can't do that, then we've really failed you over your four years here. The final 15% of your grade is how you handle the questions from the graduate students, and they're going to have to ask you questions. Um, they're not, I guess it's not the final 15% because there's more 15%. I don't know if this adds up to 100. <laughs> hope it does. Yeah, it does. Okay, thank God. Okay. Um, so can you handle the material? Can you understand the material? If the question is clearly out of line, um, I'm not holding you responsible for it, but you answer it to the best of your ability. And is your presentation on time? So if you finish in 10 minutes, that presentation is not, not on time. If you finish in two and a half hours, that presentation is not on time. But, you know, if we're more or less on time, you get 15 minutes in a bag. And that, that's a pretty easy 15% to get as well. Um, I'll go over the graduate equivalent of this in a moment. Uh, assignments, these are going to be posted on Blackboard. I will probably just post them all today. Um, I lie. I'm not going to do it today. I will post them all on Thursday. You're not going to do them anyways today, so we can all be fair to each other. Um, I, I'm just going to, I have to go through and I have to cut some questions and add some new ones and probably add a couple of extra assignments at the end. But these assignments are provided just for practice. There are no answers. Uh, in a lot of cases, there is not one right answer to the question or multiple right answers. Um, and it's not so much that they give an idea of the type of questions that will be asked in the midterm and final. They are the types of, they are the questions that will be asked in the midterm and final with very small uh, deviations. If you understood what you did on here, you're not going to have any trouble with the small deviations. Um, exams are entirely open book. Uh, we will decide the dates together. Um, the University of Windsor will give us a final date. Uh, there aren't that many of us, so we can ignore it if we like and move it to a different date. I've done that every time because I want to make sure I find a date that works for all your schedules and doesn't inconvenience you. Uh, there's no makeup midterm. If you miss the midterm, your marks just get added to the final. If you miss the mid midterm for an illegitimate reason, um, you get a zero. This is the time of COVID. Any of you guys could be sick. I'm not going to ask for sick notes. So if you're sick, that's a legitimate reason. I'm not going to be asking for a sick note for the midterm. Um, my email policy is I generally answer emails within eight business hours. Um, I actually generally answer emails within about five minutes, but you know, normally within eight business hours. So normally within 24 hours, email sent on the weekend will be answered by end of day Monday. But before an exam, I will not answer any email related to content within 24 hours before the exam. So if the exam is at 1.30 on a Wednesday, any email received by Tuesday, 1.29 p.m. will be answered and the email received after that will be ignored. So um, then there's just university boilerplate. So what I do recommend is we are gonna be online. I am gonna record and post these things to YouTube. I strongly recommend you attend the lecture because then you can ask questions and tell me, hey, I am lost. I don't understand what just happened there. Um, I can't do that if you're not here. So I strongly recommend you attend the lectures. But if you miss a lecture, you will have access to it online. Um, and if you want, or if you have it, I recommend that you consider investing in a digital tablet with a stylus so you can share a screen. Uh, there's all sorts of options. You can go for the really, really pricey ones if you're fancy and you've got lots of money. Uh, but if you're like me, you're going for a far cheaper one, which is just basically a tablet which connects up to your computer, costs about 30 bucks. And you write on a tablet with a pen and it shows up with your screen on the computer. It doesn't actually have a touch screen or a screen or anything. Um, but that's entirely up to you. Okay, that is the, I can't find my window. That is the, um, the undergraduate one. The graduate uh, syllabus differs only in the nature of the major project. So instead of a presentation, you have to write. There we go. So uh, the rest of the syllabus is absolutely identical. It is literally copy pasted. So I know it's identical. 
but you have the graduate students have a review paper. Um, you need to write an original review of a subject that has not been recently renewed reviewed. I define that as something that hasn't been reviewed in the past three years. It is 2021. So if it was 2017 or before, great. If it was, if the paper is dated, if the review is dated 2018 or later, no. Um, earlier is even better. If it's been reviewed even earlier, the last review was even earlier, that's even better. Um, or you can be taking a specific angle that is different from any extant review that is available. The, the purpose of this is for you to publish this in the literature. Um, I, as I said, I've taught this course uh, four times. The first two times we wrote three papers all three got published. The fourth time, one paper, the third time one paper was written that is currently under revision to be published. And so every single paper that a student has written for this course has been published and your authors. So the purpose of this is your graduate students, those of you in the research stream or those of you in the MMB stream, you're still, you're all still graduate students. And the purpose, one of the things about graduate school is providing original research to the literature and to the society. So if you're in a research stream, you're going to be doing that through your academic research and your original research and your experimental work and blah, blah, blah. If you're in the MMB program, you have a much more um, streamlined process, much shorter time frame, and it's, it's a course based masters. But that doesn't mean that you can't make a contribution to the scientific literature. And that's what this is about. So we're going to help synthesize something and publish it. I think that's good for your careers. I think going through that process, if you haven't already, is good. Uh, so I, I, I think that this is this is beyond the focus is on the material of the course, but the actual learning is beyond the scope of the course and is meant to kind of add to your general education as scientists. As we aim for publication, length is on the order of 6,500 to 20,000 words. That's the length of most reviews uh, with between 50 and 200 references. So we have dates of the review article by October 1st. Um, you should have a team together. Your team can be, uh, do I state how many it can be in here? If I don't, that is an oversight. Uh, you can have a team of up to three people. Uh, if we can't get everyone into teams of three, then maybe we can make one team of four. So have your team together, have a proposed project topic, and the three most relevant uh, extant review articles that are going to inform your discussion. So the things that basically you need to steer clear of, or at least uh, be considerate of uh, when you're putting this whole thing together. You might choose something so specific, it's never been reviewed before, like, oh, almost anything I'm gonna say has been reviewed before. Um, Biomaterial coatings for candy. I don't know. Using sulfur, sulfurated carbohydrates. And nobody would do that because those would be disgusting. But, you know, in that case, then you might want to have a review article on candy coatings, a review article on sulfurated carbohydrates, a review article on um, biomaterial food applications. If you can't find one directly on the subject, because I, I bet you that's never been reviewed. I bet you actually there's no original research in that area either because it's an absolutely disgusting idea to put sulfur on candy coatings. But um, if you have a new subject and you can't find anything where there is a previous review on it, find three articles that kind of help delineate the space that you're working in. If you are publishing something that is on something that has been reviewed previously, like let's say carbohydrate vaccines, uh, you'd want to find three, and you can't do that because there's been lots of really recent reviews. Um, you'd want to find so our three recent reviews on carbohydrate vaccines and say, hey, look, this is what I have to add in addition to what's available here. That's worth three of your 30 marks. On October 15th, you'll have a drafted table of contents outline um, for your review. If you've read a lot of reviews, you often see that they start with the table of contents. You're gonna have a kind of a rough idea of what that table of contents is gonna look like. Um, so at this point, you've probably done some reading. You probably sort of figured out, okay, this, there's a lot of this, there's not a lot of that. I've done some searching and all that stuff. Um, and with this, I want a short 200 word or so argument for why this order. Again, notice I'm trying to load marks on early on sort of smaller components of this, and I'll give you feedback on all of these things. November 1st, have an initial bibliography annotated. 
So a few short points on each article, why they're in your bibliography, uh, with between about 30 to 50 articles at this time. You should also have a plan on how you will find the other relevant articles. So a 200 to 500 word of your search plan. So what databases are you going to use? What search terms are you going to use? How are you going to evaluate your inclusion and exclusion criteria for putting an article into your review and so forth? Uh, December 1st, have a significant portion of the article written in draft, ideally a first full draft. Um, something I can give you some feedback on going, whoa, 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 you're way out of bounds here. This is going to end up really badly for you. The idea here is that I can give you, you know, three out of 30, small marks, um, some feedback on this to see if you're going in the right direction. And then on the end of the year is the final date for submitting the paper. You can submit it earlier if you like, um, but I'll give you till December 31st because I need to get the grades in like January 4th or something. I can always argue that they don't yell at me too loudly until about January 13th. So um, the paper will be graded for quality of the analysis. Like it, it is a review, you need to review. That it implies editor voice, not just they did this, they did this, they did this, like a listing. It needs to be a review, it needs to be showing comparison, it needs to be showing why you've arranged things in a specific order um, and what the commonalities and limitations are of the different approaches that you're talking about. Uh, the quality of the language, um, the reference format. This is really easy. You know, ideally use a reference manager. I love you if you use a reference manager because it's going to make it so much easier for us to publish this afterwards. Uh, quality of the scholarship shown, shown in collecting the references. Did you miss the big nature paper out on this thing? Because I don't know, because you did. So if I can find a, a really important paper in about five minutes of Googling that you didn't find for your review, that, that has me a little bit concerned. That's within a time frame of like recent articles coming out. Um, and it's readiness for publication. Like, do I just need to, you know, slap a few words on here and we send it out, or are we gonna basically need to tear the whole thing down and write it from scratch? All this goes into the quality of analysis um, and the, the mark of 12. After this submission deadline, uh, any high quality articles will be eligible for the mentorship to prepare them for publication. This is at your and my mutual discretion. Uh, we both have to agree. As long as half the team that wrote the article is willing to go forward with this, I'm willing to go forward with this. Um, generally, if you don't hide me, hot, hand me in a steaming pile of crap, um, I'm willing to workshop it with you and improve it. If you do hand me in something like that, that shows me your dedication to the course and material, and I'm I'm really not I'm not going to work harder than you uh, for your grades. Um, for the review article you're going to submit, it is perfectly fine to use figures from extant papers. You don't need to make your own figures. You can copy and paste them for the one you're going to submit to me. If you really want to make your own figures, go nuts. Please do. I'm not going to give you any additional grades or marks for making a figure when a figure exists in the literature. But if you're doing an analysis and you're doing a comparison of something and you're comparing multiple things, you might need to create your own figure to do that. So email policy is the same for graduate students as it is for undergraduates. Everything else is the same. The only difference is this paper. The chat has been absolutely silent. So I don't know if I am speaking into the void or if there is somebody there. And so I don't know if there are any questions about any of this, about anything to do with the syllabus. No, thank you. Yay, somebody's um. there. I have a quick question. I'm not sure if I missed it, but is there a number for the team for the review? Like how many? Sorry, I'm my speakers are really quiet. There, that should be better. Uh, sorry, Hazel, I missed that. What were you saying? Uh, I was just saying, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if I missed that, but did you mention how, how many people should we have for a team? Uh, for a team for writing, um, anywhere yeah. up to three. So two to three, four. I'll leave that to you. Okay, I see. Thank you. It's you can go it alone if you like. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you all share the same grade. I'm not. I'm not parsing who did what. So if you have a slacker on your team, it's your role to beat them regularly with wet noodles or whatever it is that gets them moving. Uh, for the undergraduates, there's. Two of them, if you guys both stay in the course, you can definitely do it as a pair. If only one of you stays in the course, I am going to amend it. 
to uh, make it less work because it's really designed for two people uh, to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Any other questions from anybody? I assume it's all fine then. Okay. So that's the syllabus. Um, this is an intro slide. <laughs> so this course is being uh, amended slightly this year. So previously, in previous years, I've really taught it as a almost another synthetic organic chemistry class, um, heavily on sugars and amino acids. I am going to tone that down a bit this year, and we are going to bring up a bit more on the application side of biomaterials and a bit more on the chemistry of those. But again, this is um, primarily a chemistry class. So what is this course? So it's it's multiple things. Um, chemistry of sugars. This is not covered in any of our other courses in our curriculum. We don't. We have a course on biomolecules at the second year level, um, a biochemistry course, but it's not normally very molecular. And so the, the focus isn't so much on the chemistry of sugars. And I'd say that uh, looking at the MMB program, I know you guys do a lot of classes in biochemistry, biotechnology, but again, it's kind of at one remove from the fundamental chemistry of the system. We, we pay lip service to it, uh, but we're actually going to get a little bit more into detail on that. Um, chemistry of, of amino acids and peptides. So again, a lot of the MMB program is on the biotech side. So we're talking about protein purification, protein expression using um, cellular expression vectors, uh, bacteria, mammalian cell culture, baculovirus insect uh, systems. We're not going to be talking about any biotechnological synthesis. This is all pure uh, bottom-up chemical synthesis. So instead, we're going to be talking a lot about peptide chemistry and solid phase peptide synthesis and the way that allows us to act, access diversity that's inaccessible using traditional biological techniques. So you can't, you can't add unnatural amino acids. Okay, let me rephrase that. It is very, very challenging to add unnatural amino acids using, you know, polymerases um, and the ribosome in a bacterial vector. There are unnatural tRNAs that have been made and can be in, used uh, along with stop codons to introduce unnatural amino acids. There's some really cool work on the last 20 years. When I was going through, it was just coming out when I was going through grad school and it was stupid exciting. Now it's gotten a little bit more routine, but it's so challenging and labor intensive, it still isn't used very often. So if you're trying to really make unnatural things, chemistry is still the best way. We're going to talk about sustainable materials, sustainable polymers, and that's mostly going to be on um, the chemistry again of these kinds of things. And so most of the sustainable plastics are polysaccharides. So basically they're sugars or they're the new kind of um, biopolymers like polylactic acid. The general idea of these sustainable polymers is they should satisfy, well, okay, we'll actually get to this in a moment when this course goes interactive for the last uh, hour, 40 minutes or so, once we, we get through this section here. And then um, I'm gonna lecture on self-immolated polymers um, this is the subclass of polymers degrade on command. So these are advanced new materials. Uh, they have all sorts of crazy applications because imagine you can take anything and degrade it when you want to. That's handy, especially in biomedicine. 
it's also handy in industrial science. Uh, these these things have existed for about 15 years, and this is just, I'm an expert in this. Um, there aren't a lot of us out there in the world who work on these things. This is something I do. It fits within the remit of the course, and I think every course you should get something from the expertise of the person teaching it. Um, fundamentally, this course kind of pivots around the idea that um, out of fundamental chemistry of biomaterials and bioorganic chemistry, we can make the next generation of materials. We've been burning coal and oil um, a long time, and we're still going to see petroleum-based polymers dominate the economy for, I, I, you know what, your guess is as good as mine. I'm going to be ridiculously surprised if they're not still the dominant form of plastic 40 years from now. But, and as, as much as I'm happier with us taking oil and turning into plastics instead of taking oil and burning it, because uh, plastics, of course, sequester the carbon. The carbon's stuck in the plastic, right? It's not in the atmosphere. I, I think where plastics are still not renewable coming from those kinds of sources. Most of the types of plastics we have, polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, these are not really, these are not biodegradable. You put them in a landfill, they are going to be in that landfill for a very, very, very long time. Uh, with the caveat that people are designing new enzymes and bacteria that can degrade these things. And um, bacteria are kind of figuring this out on their own because, you know, 50 years of plastics in the environment mean that that's an awful lot of time for bacteria to undergo evolution. And so we are seeing newly evolved bacteria that can feed on plastic waste, which is just blows my mind because you're breaking single carbon, carbon unactivated single bonds. And that's really, really hard to do. But uh, we are seeing an increase in uh, sustainable plastics. And the basic idea there is that when you're done with the material, you throw it out and it can be degraded by plat by bugs. Um, that's wonderful. I, I think that's a way forward. And theoretically, it's sustainable because you can grow plants to make these materials. You then turn them into the plastics and then you put them back into the environment where they get broken down again and you turn back to the soil where they make new plants. So you kind of close the loop. The problem with them is they're all massively more energy intensive than the petroleum based poly uh, polymers. It's really easy to make plastics out of petrol. It is not as easy to make plastics out of corn. You need to put a lot more energy in. And currently, if we're generating that energy by burning fossil fuels, um, which is what we tend to be doing in most of the world, these aren't really any better. They're actually quite a bit worse than just making the plastics out of petroleum in the first place. But, you know, in Ontario, we've shut down all our coal-fired power plants. Uh, we're starting to shut down some of the natural gas ones and oil-fired power plants. We're switching back to more hydro, more nuclear. And if you're out in the county here, you see all the wind turbines up and running. So if we're going to be powering all these plants on renewable energy, then suddenly this becomes viable and actually good for the environment. But we'll have to see where that goes. Um, self emulated materials aren't necessarily green. They can be made from, actually, they generally are made from petroleum byproducts. I'm interested in them made from amino acids and stuff. But the vast majority of the ones out there right now are all made from, you know, same stuff that we make polyethylene from. But their, their big thing is that they do degrade on command to absolutely nothing. Uh, I'm getting a note that my internet's unstable. So if you're, if you lose me, uh, please let me know so that I can repeat things because it won't record if I do that. So this course is really trying to tie all these things together. And as I'll, I'm always interested in applications. Um, I think, well, those of you in a professional master's class are definitely interested in applications. And I think that everyone in fundamental science should be always more interested in applications of what they're doing and why what they're doing matters to the world and to society. And so we are gonna be sort of trying to tie these things in together, especially in how we can apply these to solve problems in material science and biomedicine. So that's the overall scope of the course. And that's why 
sugars and amino acids go with biomaterials because the biomaterials are mostly going to be derived from sugars and amino acids and using sugar and amino acid chemistry. Uh, we've already talked about the syllabi. Check. Okay. So this is the interactive component of the course. Um, I, looking at this, I, I'm, it's, I think it's difficult enough going through a degree, um, especially because the majority of this class is on the MMB program, where you're not fully as fully integrated into the department as a whole as other people. Uh, but I've never met any of you, but I think it's even harder under COVID-19 because no one's met anybody ever. And most of you now are going into your, oh God, like third year of online learning. And I am so sorry for that. There's gonna be people completing their degrees here without ever setting foot on our campus, which is just ridiculous. So I am going, to, I, I do wanna have this as much as possible with the idea in this course is you can interrupt me at any time and say, I don't get that. Can you repeat that again? That's great. Because if you don't get it, lots of people don't get it. And that's gonna be the case. Um, but still a lot of this is kind of on traditional lectures where I'm, I'm going to be delivering knowledge and information. You're going to be taking it in and using that to solve problems. Anyways, but for now, I want to talk about this. So I want, I want your ideas on when you hear the word biomaterial and sustainable, these got tossed together in a title for the course. Uh, I think it's like biosustainable materials, but let, let's pull these, parse these two words apart. So what do these mean to you guys? Uh, English is not my first language, but biomaterials sounds to me like well, compounds can be synthesized within, you know, um, ah, damn it, sorry. Just not, not by synthetic chemists, but by, you know, um, biology. Living, living, yeah, maybe that too. I'll go with uh, that. Eco friendly, um, somehow. Eco-friendly. So you're going to, where do you want to put eco-friendly under biomaterial or sustainable? No, biomaterial. I'm going to put it that in brackets. It can be either natural or synthetic, but um, yeah. Okay. Is a biomaterial necessarily eco-friendly? Uh, probably not. I mean, um, in my opinion, something that's eco-friendly would come under sustainable. I think so. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. Um, you can have things derived from biology, which are incredibly toxic once you've made them available. And those would not be eco-friendly. Um, cyanide is incredibly is a biomaterial sign like you know what it's in all sorts of things cyanide also kills everything in sight um and a lot of you know a lot of organisms spend all their time making antibiotics to kill everything else so I, i'm cautious with biomaterial being eco-friendly so I, I agree sustainable is almost a synonym is eco-friendly any other comments on any of this Thoughts. I know you're all really smart. I know you all have thoughts. Oh, biomaterial can be degradable. But sustainable, it depends on, I mean, maybe not, <laughs> whatever I say, <laughs> uh, I thought maybe you want to. I agree. No, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> I think, 
I think to be sustainable, you do need some form of degradability. Because if it's not degradable ever, then it's not it is sustainable, sustainable. technology because you're <laughs> you're throwing something on the earth that will never be gotten rid of. And so you can't do it at infinitum. And if you can't do it infinite for infinity, then it's not sustainable. So I've heard from three people, but there's lots more here. I'm patient. Uh, maybe for sustainability, uh, just the like ease of which it can be made, like not super energy intensive. Right, I love that. Uh, low energy manufacturing, absolutely. Um, often when we get we get sometimes locked in when we're thinking about sustainable because it, it's a it's a broad word it can mean lots of things and it can be environmental absolutely but also economic because you know the chemical industry gets a bad rap um and people go well why can't the chemical industry be greener or more sustainable or more environmentally friendly and the chemical industry is very interested in being as green and as environmentally friendly as possible because energy costs money waste costs money. Uh, you know if you need to prove if you need to put a lot of stuff in and you only get a tiny bit of it out that you can sell compared to putting a lot of stuff in and getting lots of stuff out that you can sell. You want to get you want to put as many of your inputs into your product as possible, you want to minimize your waste because what first of all because that costs you money to buy that stuff and you're not gonna be able to make money off of it. Secondly, it's going to cost you money to dispose of it. So waste is very expensive. Energy is very expensive. So sustainably economically is also sustainably environmentally. Normally they go directly together. Thanks, Lucas. Ahmed, do you have any thoughts? Uh, another thing about biomaterial compatible with uh, living things. <laughs> Sorry. Living things. Yeah, generally, I would say it is. Yeah, I would generally compatible. I'm always I'm always going to give myself a caveat. There are uh, participation grades for the grad students, I think it's 10% of your grade. Um, just throwing it out there. So good idea to participate. But if you don't have any more thoughts about this, we do have some more of these where I can get some more voices in there. Um, I think this com basically covers that. So what I, 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 I think we have a good sense in here of what we mean by these terms. Uh, a biomaterial normally is derived from something biological. And normally we pretend that coal and petroleum are not biological for that, although of course they are like fossilized dinosaurs and plants and stuff, uh, mostly plants. I always wanted to be dinosaurs, but there really weren't enough dinosaurs to give us all the coal and oil we got. It's mostly pre-dinosaur stuff. Um, I just like dinosaurs, but we're gonna exclude those carbon sources and really derive it from recently living plant material or animal material. Or a mimetic of it. So you can have fully synthetic biomaterials that never were inside a plant. Um, but they are, we're trying to mimic some of the things that go out there in nature. So, you know, the types of glues that mussels use to bind themselves to the ocean floor, 
because uh, they don't they're really become actually much more become much stronger in water and some of those actually become stronger when you apply pressure to them so nothing happens if there's no pressure applied but when you apply pressure the uh, the polymer hardens which is really freaking cool or uh, spider silk which is just ridiculously strong oh even human hair is ridiculously strong so we can make materials based on these kinds of concepts uh, whereas sustainable means can keep doing it. Economically, environmentally. And I think if you're going to get involved in this in solving problems in these areas long term as a career, you always need to keep both these in mind. Uh, they, they need to go together. If it's not economically viable, viable, it doesn't matter how environmentally friendly it is, nobody is going to use your technology. And if it's not environmentally uh, friendly, you're going to have a lifetime cap on how that is. So you want to always try and make your stuff as environmentally friendly as possible. I can never spell chemistry right. I just type it wrong every single time I type it. Um, so the other two concepts that we have in here are bioorganic chemistry and biochemistry. This course is much more on the bioorganic side than on the biochem. So what how would how how what's your working definition of these terms? I'm just throwing chem, I guess. Um. You were thinking Ronas and then decided not to. <laughs> I just want to say something and and then no, I say it. Come on. <laughs> it's bad, but um, let me think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think what's the difference between these. Are they the I'm same thing? My... Yeah. 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 Kind of the same. Kind just like it, there's, I really don't know about bio inorganic chemistry. I mean, so <laughs> well, bio inor so bio inorganic would actually also be uh, associated with this. You could add as a third thing. Um, we're talking about sugars and amino acids, so we're not going to be doing dealing with a lot of like uh, magnesium and calcium ions in the metal of a catalyst, and starting to talk about um, transition metal catalysis and photochemistry in a biological context because. I am not an inorganic chemist, and those mechanisms confuse me and bore me. Uh, they bore me because they confuse me. So we're we're really focusing on bioorganic. So it is organic molecules we're working with. I, I I do agree. If you're saying they're kind of the same, they are. We're talking about the same area of science. We're talking about the chemistry of biology in both cases. Um. But we're looking at it from different angles. So biological biochemistry is about uh, by I got uh, it's about the uh, biological process. I can you do by, elaborate? I agree with you. Can you elaborate that a little bit? I mean, um, it's about biological process by using um, chemistry. <laughs> okay, I, I agree with that. So let, let, I'm gonna rephrase it slightly. Okay. Um, I'm gonna write it as the molecular basis of biological processes. Study of.
And I think, so biochemistry in a lot of cases has its roots, like fundamentally as a field has its roots in chemistry, though it shifted significantly, I'd say in the last 80 years to really kind of cement itself from biology instead. And it's because we've had an improved understanding of biology. And so it makes a bit more sense to approach it from biology. And so what we're often looking at is, as Rona has just said, the study of the molecular basis of biological processes. Um, so why does biology do the things it does? Well, all it does, like I, I am, um, I'm a materialist reductionist. And so I believe I am just a walking bag of water with a few chemicals in there, all of which kind of work together to create complex molecular interactions, which eventually lead to thoughts so that I can talk about complex molecular interactions eventually leading to thoughts. But I'm no more than a ridiculously complex um, machine, but the machine is so complex, it really doesn't matter that it's a machine anymore because it's just so ridiculously complex. But Everything I do is a function of chemicals doing things together and working together to allow for motion, to allow for thought, to allow for metabolism so that I can drink my Pepsi and eat my egg sandwich um, and uh, be awake enough to talk about this because I took caffeine, which is activating some certain receptors in my brain, which um, keep me from drifting off. So. Bio biochemistry is really coming down, looking at how all that happens. So what about bioorganic chemistry? I think we have a textbook definition here. Um, <laughs> that, that's fair. You know what? If this is an open thing book, I agree. So I think um, Ahmed's put in the chat, bioorganic chemistry is a scientific discipline that combines organic chemistry and biochemistry, while biochemistry aims at understanding biological processes using chemistry. I think so. I think I'm going to define it slightly differently. Because um, again, there's no real set definition, because there's no one to make up the rules on what these things mean. But if we're trying to differentiate these, um, using chemistry on biomolecules. To change outcomes. And I think this gets at the fundamental difference between how biologists and chemists approach science. Uh, like the, the, the fields get really, really messy and mixy here at the interface and we are at the interface for this course um but biology is the study of things that exist and trying to figure out how they work chemistry isn't so much the study of things that exist it's the it's trying to figure out how to do something that doesn't exist and how to change impact so biology and physics both study things as they are and try and understand them chemistry is about can we change the things that are to something else um, using tools? And yeah, there is some study of how uh, of the way things are in chemistry as well, but generally we want to change things. Um, and we can change everything because we can just, you know, I don't like this amino acid. I'm putting in a completely different one. It's going to change absolutely everything. That's a, that's a chemistry approach to a biological problem, whereas biology will be understanding what that amino acid is doing. So there's a difference in in the viewpoint on this thing, but the material is kind of the same. And so in a lot of cases, things we're going to be discussing here, we can approach it from a biochemical perspective, where we're trying to understand the role that these things play in biology, or we can approach it from a chemical perspective where we're trying to understand how we can modify them to change biology. 
this is not a biology class. Um, this is in a department of chemistry and biochemistry. And so we're focusing kind of on that second definition a bit more. Okay. Carbohydrates and amino acids. This is gonna be the focus of this course. Um, there are two of the four big classes of macromolecules along with nucleic acids and lipids. Um, I don't know enough about nucleic acids. I don't actually have anything interesting to say about nucleic acids. Um, there's so much interesting stuff that's been done. There's so many people doing really cool things out there. Um, a lot of fundamental biochemistry courses really, really focus on uh, DNA and RNA. And there's, to get function, you can't mess with them too much. Because if you start messing with DNA and RNA at a chemical level, they stop being DNA and RNA and then they don't work right. Um, and maybe you can stretch a little bit and get things to work a little bit right, but you don't have as much flexibility. Whereas in carbohydrates and amino acids, you can play. There's all sorts of things we can change in here. Um, lipids as well, you can do all sorts of things, but lipids are really boring. And I just personally don't care about lipids. And so I think that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them because it's just the bias of the course. So if, if you're like a lipid fan, um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Drew Markhart, is also a lipid fanatic, and he has a course on lipids, which I really haven't taken. So, um, what do they do? <laughs> like, what are they and what do they do? Like, roles in biology here. So now, now, now we'll think like biologists. These are two important structure. Okay, why are they important? I agree they're important. Is there? Uh, carbon hydrates is the resource energy, and yeah. amino acids is a basic for peptides. Okay, building block for peptides and proteins, right? Okay. That is central dogma of biology stated pretty clearly. Um, I, I think that's only part of what both of these do. So we can break down that peptides and proteins and what do peptides and proteins do? And carbohydrates do so much more than just being energy. Carbohydrates also bound with peptides and acting as a signal on the surface of cells. Am I making sense? I think I am. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, so again, if we go back to, I, I, it, it, I guess, it is almost like a pseudo religious belief of mine that I am a walking bag of chemicals. Um, I need my walking bag of chemicals to tell things to do things over certain time frames. And so if if I need a long term change, like at a species level, we will change our genetic code right like over millions of years humans have evolved from our, you know, evolved as a great ape, uh, but we are definitely different from other great apes. And we've done that because our genetic code is different, but that takes a really long time. I, as a human being, can't suddenly evolve into a post-human just because I feel like it. Um, so as a human, what can I do to change? Well, I have, if I really want a really long-term change, I can do an epigenetic change, right? I can silence certain genes. I can tie them up in the histone. I can methylate them, uh, the nucleic acids. I can do all sorts of things to make sure that gene doesn't speak or I can upregulate so that that's what I can do long term so it normally shuts things down and we're talking timelines of years there if I want something really 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 fast uh electrical signals right nervous and Im nerve impulses um I am I don't have my camera on because no one has their camera on but if I feel like moving my hand I can say move my thumb boom like really, really fast. And that's a, that's nervous electrical impulse. So that's a really fast signal I've got. If I want a 
you know, a reasonably fast signal, but not instantaneous like that. Um, we've got the neurotransmitters and our hormones in our brain, right? So like if suddenly a giant vampire came in through my door, I probably would have an adrenaline rush of adrenaline hormone going through my entire body um, and probably a lot of cortisol as well, getting really, really stressed uh, before I got whatever, you know, hormone the vampire would put into me to suck my blood and turn me into a vampire. So that we're talking on the order of seconds, like this is milliseconds. If I want something, you know, a little bit like on the order of hours to days or weeks, I can change my gene expression pathways. So I can upregulate or downregulate protein expression. And in between, you know, neurotransmitters, hormones will be a little bit slower than that. Like, you know, I'm not currently hungry, but as I keep digesting my egg sandwich that I had this morning, I will become hungry and I will start looking longingly at the trail mix that is in my drawer. Then that's because I've got, you know, my leptin levels are falling and I, my body wants more calories. Um, well, let's face it, I'm always hungry. <laughs> my body always wants more calories. I can eat all day long, but that's a hormonal change. Um, it's a little bit slower than the neurotransmitters. If we want something intermediate between gene regulation and hormones, that's where sugars come in. So sugars turn over in a matter of hours on the cell surface. So if you want your cell to talk to another cell and do something, you can express certain sugar codes on your cell surface and your sugar and your cell will say, hey, I want to do X and interact with other cells doing X and we're all going to do X together. Uh, but those sugars will degrade in a few hours. So you, you know that signal is not going to be out there for too long. So that gives you, so sugars give you this intermediate level of signaling time. Um, we do not understand how that works at all there i i would say that this is maybe the most important thing that we need to figure out or trying to figure out how cells talk to one another they talk to one another through the sugar code we don't understand the sugar code um i don't think we're going to understand anytime soon and there's, there's people who will sell you the idea that we'll understand it really soon, but these are the same people who, you know, 30 years ago said we're going to sequence the human genome, and once we have the human genome sequence, we'll understand everything there is to know about humans, and of course, that's just not true. Uh, and then once they did that, they were like, okay, you know what we really need to do is we need to sequence the human proteome, and we need to know what every single cell and every single protein is being coded in every single cell at every single moment in time, and then we'll understand exactly how all cells work, and of course, that doesn't work either. And so now they're coming out and saying we need to sequence the human glycome and we need to figure out what every single sugar on every single surface of every single cell at any single point in time and how that forces cells to interact with one another. And once we understand that completely, we understand everything. You know, none of these, all of these are oversold. Um, they're all true, but at the same time, they're all insufficient because everything is playing back on everything else and everything is interacting with everything else. And I basically biology makes me want to scream and cry because there's no way I'm ever going to understand it, which is why I'm a chemist, because I can understand really simple things like banging two molecules together. So surface signaling agents, really important for carbohydrates and probably growing importance. I think more and more stuff is going to come into this in the next 10, 15 years. This is going to be a dominant growth area in biology. So what else do we have for either carbohydrates or amino acids and what they do? Well, let's think about immune response. Nucleic acid components. So your DNA and RNA, of course, are comprised of ribose and deoxyribose, which are sugars. 
Um, so you wouldn't really have any of that. So obviously sugars came before nucleic acids and DNA. So sugars predate nucleic acids, which is really interesting. Um, if we're thinking, but again, primarily we're gonna be coming back to energy. The other things they get used for is, is really cool things. They get used for um, um, desiccation protection. So if you've heard about these, I can't what they are right off the top of my head, but these um, species of bugs that we can like launch into the vacuum of space and then recover them like weeks later and bring them back and are alive, which is just mind blowing because they should be like, you know, sucked out and everything dead and like deoxygenated and killed. Um, it's because they have high levels of sugars in their cells that keep all the water in because the, the ionic strength is so high or the um, clicative properties of the solution is so high. But you're also seeing this in plants and uh, bugs that are, and frogs and things that are more natural. They use sugars to protect themselves from freezing. So freezing protection as well, but this is, it's basically the same thing as desiccation protection. They are structural components. I'm currently looking at a squirrel playing in a tree outside my office. Those trees are mostly cellulose, right? That, that's really what's making up the bulk of that tree. That's what wood is, is mostly just cellulose. And we cut it up real fine and pulp it and make it into paper, or we cut it into boards and we make houses out of it. But basically our houses are made of sugar. Or, you know, not 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 Essex Hall where I am. This is like cement bricks. But my my house at home is um is a wood house, so it's a sugar house. Not as much fun as a gingerbread house, of course. But more practical for Canada. So in terms of amino acids, when we're thinking about everything they're doing. You know, we can, we can do like protein stuff. So I'm not gonna define what proteins do. You guys all know what proteins do. They do freaking everything. But amino acids themselves are also hormones on their own. So sometimes we pump out amino acids and they are hormones. Sometimes we pump them out and they are neurotransmitters. They are actually also energy sources because when it comes right down to it, life is all about, yeah, absolutely. Polysaccharides are structural elements and cell walls of bacteria and plants. When it comes down to it, all we are are machines meant to, you know, well, reproduce. So we're really, really good at finding energy in anything we can take in. So we have lots of our metabolism is designed on breaking down amino acids into pyruvate and so we can turn that into energy sources to stick that into the glycolysis cycle and all that stuff um but yeah like they're and then you know proteins are structural components as well there's a lot so what it basically is is there is a lot of overlap on this list and that's because nature loves using everything for everything they do signaling as well, of course. Lists actually overlap a lot. The focus is different. And I think Hazel gave us the focus right off the bat with sugars, mostly energy, proteins, mostly function, but the two also interplay with each other to just add general complexity. So we're at 950. Um, I'm going to actually save the next part of the course for the next class. We're going to start talking about carbohydrate structure. We're going to start talking about um, why they're weird in solution. And then we're going to start talking about something called the anomeric effect, which is why they're weird in solution and what drives the chemistry of carbohydrates. And we're going to be applying it and trying to figure out how we can make carbohydrates or basically take monosaccharides and make oligosaccharides out of them.
So I think that's where I'm going to leave it for today. And I will see you guys Wednesday. Any questions before we break up? Normally, this is where like, I stand in front of the class awkwardly until everyone leaves, just in case anyone has anything they want to talk about. No, thank you. Okay, I will take this as the virtual equivalent of everybody packing up their bags and just walking out the door. So I will see you guys on Wednesday. Um, I'll arrange uh, office hours available, but again, normally the end of class is a great time to come talk to me if you've got something you want to talk about. Because if some, again, if something about the course material is probably something that everyone else is confused about too. And if it's not about the course material, send me an email and we'll arrange a private time because they don't want to do it in office hours anyways, because then people can come barging in and that gets a problem. Okay, take it easy, guys. Have a good day.